everyone and welcome to our evening tonight where we'll be late taking a look at making prayer powerful. We'll uh, begin tonight with a prayer, if you all stand please. Dear God in heaven, we come before you now thankful for the day that you've blessed us with. Thank you for this time to consider prayer and how we can make it powerful in our lives. We know that it's so important to have a relationship with you, God, and we pray that tonight would help us to understand just at least a little more how we can be uh, more powerfully connected to you and for our relationship to be strengthened. We pray that you would be with us tonight, help us to understand the things that we hear and to believe them as well uh, so that they can become a reality in the way we live our lives. We pray that you keep us safe if it is your will and that you'd send your son back to this earth very soon and it's in his name we approach you now. Amen. So Stephen Dowling uh, is going to be speaking tonight and he's asked that as an introduction for his talk, we read together Matthew 6, verse 1 to 16, and James Taylor is going to read that for us, after which I'll ask Steve to come straight up. Thanks. Reading together Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 16. Beware of practising your righteousness before other people in order to be seen of them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. For when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that, your giving may be, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, Neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces in their fasting that may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Thank you for the reading, James, and thank you, Luke. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Bible address this evening. How are we all? Good. Excellent. Can't hear you with the masks on, but I'm just also going to assume you're all smiling happily and very glad to be here. So, making prayer powerful. There is prayer, and then there is powerful prayer. So this evening, we're going to try and work our way through to make this more powerful for all of us in our lives. Now, when I first started looking to this subject, 
it is quite amazing how the term prayer now seems to be tied very closely to this idiom called thoughts and prayers. It seems to be the, the prayers and thoughts and thoughts and prayers. And it was very much somebody's fault who did this, who for quite a long time, whenever there was an incident and there were many, instead of actually doing something, the fallback was always this idea of saying, my prayers and condolences to the families of the victims of the terrible Florida shooting. And I only wanted to use one example, but there are many. And it seemed like everybody else who fell in behind the line would put theirs up and it would read basically the same thing, thoughts and prayers, prayers and thoughts. And it got to the point where the idea of actually doing something was so left field that that would never be the consideration. It was always, mm, we'll just send out thoughts and prayers. And I think they lost in themselves the idea of what it actually means. And it actually got to the point where you can see there, help! Oh no, that's terrible. My thoughts and prayers are with you. But thoughts and prayers... He could have just thrown the life jacket in there or the life boy in there to help him, but again, and this is the mentality that some people have now, unfortunately. It's lost the ideal of what it is. What is prayer? So tonight, we're going to look into it. We're going to nut it out a little bit. We'll look at the ultimate example given to us that we just read from, which is Christ's example, and see what we can try and draw out of that for ourselves. So... How can we pray to God when we can't see him? How is it possible? If we ask for help from our family or a friend, they tell us straight away how they feel about it. They can communicate immediately back to us. It makes it very easy for us. But God is in heaven and there is no answering voice from him. But we'll see how that can be changed. So, some of the questions. How do we know what he thinks? Is there any point in praying at all? If there is, how should we actually do it? How should we pray? Do we stand up? Do we kneel down? Do we do it on the side of the bed, while in the bed, head on the pillow, looking up to the sky, arms stretched out, arms held together? What are the proper etiquettes? Do you have to speak out loudly so God can hear you? Or does he hear our whispers? And also, why do people say amen when we're finished praying? Maybe for you the prayer could be comfort and guidance for yourself with God. So let's take a look at prayer in the Bible and see how to go about it. And in doing this, we can see how to make prayer powerful for each of us in our lives. So, before I put the next one up, um, does anybody know what the first recorded prayer was? Except for the two people I was speaking to this morning. So the first recorded prayer was actually Eliezer. Eliezer was a servant of Abraham, who was known as the father of Israel. Sure, there might have been communications before that, things like when Cain and Abel were offering their sacrifices, that was a form of it, but this is the first actual recorded prayer that we know of. So as we can see, it's in Genesis 24 and verse 40. So the first book of the Bible and chapter 24. So a humble servant of Abraham named Eliezer, he'd been instructed by his master to travel hundreds of miles to a place called Haran, the town of Abraham's relatives, in order to find a suitable wife for Abraham's son. When he arrived there, he had no idea which of the young women of the city would be the best one for his master's son. He'd never been there before, so he prayed. If you have a look in Genesis 24, and at verse 40, it tells us exactly what he said. So he said, and he said unto me, 
The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel by me. Send his angel with thee and prosper thy way, and thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. Then shalt thou be clear from his, this my oath, when thou comest to my kindred, if they give not thee one, thou shalt be clear from my oath. So that was Abraham telling him what he had to do. So then he went the hundreds of miles. It says he took ten camels with him. And I came this day unto the well, and I said, O Lord God, my master, Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water, and I say to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher to drink, and she says to me, both drink thou, and I'll also draw for the camels. Let it be the same woman who the Lord hath appointed for my master's son. So that's his prayer. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to stand next to this well. I've been travelling a long time. I'm going to have a little sip of water, or I need some water. The first person that comes up and I'm going to ask them, can I have some water? If they say yes, and I will also give your camels water, I know that that's the person. Now, when you dig a little deeper into that, some people forget the camels are driven a long way, 10 camels. The average camel, when it's thirsty, drinks 100 litres of water. So if you're going to give camels a drink, you can't just say, look, here's a little dog bowl, have a drink. So the average well, they would walk down the stairs into the well, they'd carry a pitcher that could hold the average 20 litre jerry can of water, so 20 litres, and then back up again. So how many times up and down for one camel times 10? So it was also a very good way of making sure she was a very fit lady that he was choosing. She wasn't sitting... The first lady I see sitting under a tree reading a magazine, that's the one for my... So this wasn't the case. This was a fit person. But he says, before I had even done speaking in my heart, so he was praying in his heart. He wasn't saying this aloud. Nobody knew what he was doing. It was in his heart. Behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down into the well and drew water. And I said unto her, Let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste. So she didn't actually do this slowly. She ran up and down the stairs and said, Drink, and I'll give your camels to drink also. So there is the first recorded prayer. So he would have been so excited, the fact that straight away his prayer had been answered. What do we learn from Eliezer's prayer? First, do we actually have to be inside a church or a hall or somewhere special to pray? No, we don't. He was standing next to a well, technically in the middle of nowhere. When we need God's help, we can speak to him from our heart. He will hear us straight away. And when we really do know what we want, we can follow these examples and we can even ask God for a sign. But there is a condition. As we've got on the board, James chapter 1 tells us that in the New Testament it says that if we ask God for a sign because we lack the wisdom to know which option is best, we must have the faith to follow the course that he chooses for us. And James says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach or criticism, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like waves of a sea that is driven and tossed by the wind, so that that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. So that's important. The fact that you can't, it's almost that thing of, look, I'll toss a coin and that will tell me the answer. Ah, it's heads. I'm going to go three out of... <laughs> you know? The answer's the answer. Sometimes it might not suit you. There's one last important thing we can pick up from Eliezer's prayer. When he knew that God had answered his plea and his cry for help, he immediately went down onto his knees and said thank you to God in prayer as well. This is how he finishes the story. Then I bowed down my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, 
who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. And that is a great example of prayer. What about then, what does Jesus say about prayer? A perfect example for us. The Lord Jesus Christ was always praying. He would slip out either early in the morning before the crowds would come along and speak to God in prayer. He'd then do that in the evening as well and even overnight. His disciples could see, just by his example, that prayer was very important to him. So one day they asked him, teach us how to pray. And this is where we get our lesson today. This is for everyone, not just Jesus' disciples. So this is our reading for this evening from Matthew chapter 6. So in reading from verse 5, he says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. It's not about the show. It's not about standing there, waving your arms around, ringing bells. He says, look, their reward is the fact that the people have already seen it and said, wow, that's really good. That's the reward they get for that. And he says, but when thou prayest, enter into a closet. And when you've shut the door, pray to the Father, which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So again, just like Eliezer who prayed in his heart, but nobody could hear, God heard it. God heard it loud and clear and answered it loud and clear. That's what he's saying. Go into a quiet place where you're by yourself with your God. He also says, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions. Don't repeat yourself. That's what the heathens do. It's not a matter of repeating the same thing over and over and over and over. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Some of the most powerful prayers in the Bible are very short, quick prayers. Nehemiah, who was serving the king, the king one day noticed he was looking a bit sad and he turned to him and he said, what's wrong with you? And he says, immediately in his head, he said, help me, Lord. And then he told him what his problem was. And that was a prayer. For your father knows the things that you have need of. God already knows. He's just waiting for you to knock on the door and tell it. So after this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus told them that they could start off by addressing God as their father. This was revolutionary for these people. They'd never heard of this. Most of the Jews of the time of Jesus would have thought God as the creator and a man far away in heaven. That was the relationship they had. Passed down the law, passed down all these things that they had followed and understood and this bright shining light that you could not approach for fear of death... And suddenly, this person saying, call him dad. To speak to him as a father was closer than they'd ever thought that was possible. Yet sometimes Jesus even starts his prayer with the word Abba, which in Hebrew basically translates to dad or daddy. So he is petitioning his father. So we can speak to God as our dad. Perhaps if we choose to become his adopted sons and daughters, that is. In Romans 8, verse 14, it tells us that if we are guided by God's power, we are the sons and daughters of God. We're also then told of a Roman centurion called Cornelius, who had his prayers answered long before he came to know a lot about Jesus. 
In Acts 10, it tells us the story of Cornelius, who was a very faithful man, a Roman soldier, faithful, who looked after his city and looked after the Jews in the city. An amazing example. So he was faithful even before he knew what faithful really was. His prayer was answered and he was then shown the true path to righteousness by God. That's to say, although God in heaven will graciously listen to us here on earth, we must always treat him with a deep respect. So again, in Cornelius' case, he did pray and then he got the answers he needed and then he learnt the things that he needed to implement in his life. So in verse 10 we read about God's kingdom. It says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Sorry, pardon me, one other slide I just forgot. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So the hallowed, with all respect, basically hallowed is great, awesome, powerful is your name. And this is the respect that we have and that we have to show. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Jesus told his disciples to pray for the kingdom of God to come. He described it as a time when all people here on earth will do the will of God, just as God's angels obey him in heaven now. The coming of the kingdom will be good for the world because God has solemnly promised that Jesus is going to bring his blessings to all nations and all people. It will also be good for believers For those that are dead will be raised again to share in a wonderful age together. As the Apostle Paul quotes, things that no eye has seen or ear heard or mind imagined are the things God has prepared for those who love him. And it also says, when we wait for the Saviour, Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly, vile bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So in Philippians it's saying people's bodies will change. We've all got older friends, family members, and you see them slowly deteriorating, and it's an awful thing to witness. This is saying that's going to be turned around. And it also then says there are things that you will see and you'll hear and you'll be able to do. You can't even imagine it right now. That's what this kingdom is going to be like. So a time so amazing that we'll have bodies that work properly, they don't get tired or sore, in a world too brilliant for any of us to actually imagine. This is what we're praying for. In this model prayer, the next thing Jesus lists for us is about today's food and asking God for it. It's an interesting note that every time Jesus ate something, he always said a prayer of thanks to God, as we should. In the West, we have so much to choose from, some supermarkets, we can easily forget that in the end, God is the one who sends the sunshine and the rain, and God's the one that makes the corn to grow in the fields. People in Jesus' time, like many people that live overseas today, have no refrigerators, no means of keeping food fresh, and they rely and depend on God to feed them every single day. Jesus promised his disciples if they made the kingdom of God the most important goal in their lives, God would provide for them with the basics of existence, like food and clothes. But we must not expect luxuries. When God looks after us, we must always give him thanks. So bread's enough. Bread will keep us going. It's when you start looking outside of the normal things that we need that aren't necessary. So the next thing that it talks about, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The next stage in the Lord's Prayer has to do with our relationship with God. Jesus says that we should ask for forgiveness of debts or sins, as the Bible calls them. 
What are sins? So in the Bible, the word for, si- for this is essentially for breaking the rules of God, which then extend to breaking the rules of man, because we are instructed to respect and obey the government's orders of the land. So you can't just because you say, I believe in God, I'm doing 100 down this 60 zone. So that's still part of it. So God says he wants us to be kind to others, to treat them as if we were wearing their shoes. Somebody once said, if you want to know what somebody else is like, if you've got an argument, walk a mile in their shoes, and by that time it doesn't matter, you're a mile away and you've got a new pair of shoes. So he wants us always to speak the truth and to keep our promises. He hates things like adultery and theft and despising or hurting those who are below us. He wants us to show love, even to our enemies. Most of us, when pressed, will admit that we are sinners. But sadly, the need to own up to our sins causes some people to stumble. Because we might be too proud to accept that we need God to forgive us. Without God's forgiveness, we unfortunately have no future. Unless our sins are being taken away, we must stay forever in the grave. God is looking for people for his kingdom, but they must be set free from sin before he will grant them the huge privilege of eternal life. And that forgiveness can only be through the sacrifice of Jesus himself. As the apostles put it concisely, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's that Romans 6, verse 23 quote. The wages, the payment for sin is death. And unfortunately, we all sin. On top of that, we then have to also forgive. So we're asking for forgiveness, but what is that if we can't actually forgive ourselves? Now Jesus adds a rule that we must follow. If we want God to forgive the bad things that we've done that upset him, we must be prepared to show forgiveness ourselves. It's very reasonable, but very difficult. To forgive and forget the hurtful things people have done to us, whether it was at work, out in the street, the neighbours, inside our house, our brothers and sisters, takes a whole lot to let go of. Think about the Christians back in Jesus' time, just after Jesus was crucified around Jerusalem, whose husbands and children were imprisoned and put to death, all with the help of a young man called Saul of Tarsus in the early days of the church as it was establishing. How would these people feel when then a little bit later along came to their meetings a reformed young man who was Saul, who had his name changed to Paul, And he walked in happily wanting to shake hands with everyone. How would your forgiveness go on that level? Suppose your partner leaves you for someone else or your children steal your savings. Can you ever make peace with them in your heart? Yet that is what we're expected and that is what God expects us to do when we ask him to forgive us as well. Maybe that's something that we can chew on for a little while. Lead us not into temptation. Lastly, Jesus says that we should ask God not to lead us into temptation. A little bit of explanation on this. The Apostle James insisted that God himself will never tempt us to do wrong. Have a look over at James chapter 1 and verse 13. So in James chapter 1 and verse 13, it says it nice and simple. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Temptation, he says, comes from the inside of us. God can't be tempted with evil, so he can't tempt anybody. But each person is tempted 
when he's lustful and enticed by his own desires. We can't help thinking the things we think. We can help how long we think on those things. And the classic example that I always use whenever I talk about this sort of thing is Bob Lloyd used to say, when a bird lands on your head, you've got a bird on your head. But when you go home and look in the mirror and there's a nest with a bird on it, you have a problem. So, shoo the bird away. The Greek word that Luke uses for temptation can also mean trial or testing. None of us enjoys having our faith tested any more than we enjoy sitting down for exams at school. Yet, sometimes God will allow us to walk into a situation where we'll find our faith stretched to its limit, and that is us being tested. God does not want a series of robots to be with him. He wants people that love him of their own free will. It is in those difficult times when everything seems to be going wrong and we begin to doubt that we need to pray and ask God not to leave us. You might remember well the Psalm of David in Psalm 23 where he writes as if he was a lamb and God was his shepherd. He says he has to go through the valley of the shadow of death but he knows that God is with him and his rod and staff are there to comfort him. So that is what Jesus answered when they asked him how to pray. He did not mean that they must always use exactly those words or that they should repeat them over and over and over again as if God did not hear them the first time it was said. He just listed some of the important topics. We can include all of them, one of them, any of them in our daily prayers. Perhaps there's more things that we can add. We have a duty to say thank you to God for his care and his love in our life. We also need to ask him to help other people. We should not only pray for ourselves. A great example of this is in Ephesians chapter 6. If you have a look at that. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18... So here the Apostle Paul, everybody that was reading this letter that he sent out to them, he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul knew where he was headed. He knew the problems that he was going to face. Paul asked his readers to pray for him. When he knew he was going to face trial in Rome, in the courts, and he was talking to all the followers of Jesus. We can pray for our friends who are in danger or suffering from pain, depression, hunger or persecution. It might seem like the smallest thing to us, but the biggest thing in their lives. So Jesus took it one step further. Jesus said that we should actually pay for our enemies as well, in the hope that they may turn and become our friends. So at the end of Jesus' prayer, though, he added, like a little summary, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And this is what we said before. What does amen actually mean? Really simple. Let it be so. So if you speak your mind to God with the things that you want are true and honest and open, 
you're saying, please let it be so. So when we're talking to God, God is very great. So we must treat him with respect in everything that we do. But he also loves us tenderly and we don't need to be afraid of him. We don't have to use special words to speak to God. Just our everyday way of talking will do. If we get in a jumble, it does not matter. He understands and knows. Majority of the time, all the time, he is waiting to hear it from you and knows exactly what you're going to say but needs to hear it from you. Provided our heart is humble and we truly love him, he understands our weaknesses. And the fact that there are over who knows how many thousands of different languages around the world, I'm sure us speaking proper English or not, is not going to make too much difference. Plus also, we have a huge advantage. Jesus is up at the right hand of God. And he knows what it's like to face temptations like we do. Fear and suffering have all been through his life. This is what the Bible says about him in Hebrews. For if we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we have somebody that sits beside God who lived a life on earth, suffered like we suffer, worse than we could ever imagine, was tempted, tormented, abused, and he sits beside God now as our mediator between us and God, explaining, yes, that's really tough. It's not like a person that doesn't understand what we're going through, and that is our biggest advantage. Something very important with prayer is to keep trying. Immediately after outlining his model prayer, Jesus told the story of a man who had visitors. So Luke 11, if we have a quick look at Luke 11, it will tell us this little story that Jesus told that will help us with keep trying. So Luke 11 and verse 5 starts... And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though, He will not rise and give him because he is friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. So, breaking it down nice and simple. The man had visitors suddenly show up at his house at midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. They came unexpectedly, very late, they had no food, and he didn't have any food in the house. So he rushed to his neighbour's house. Can I borrow some bread? He didn't even open the door for him. And his friend's there going, "Um, I'm asleep. The kids are asleep in bed with me. It's too comfortable. It's cold out. I don't want to get up. And he's like, can I have some bread, please? His friend didn't jump up out of bed because he was his friend. Basically... His his neighbour grumbled at first because he had already gone to sleep. But when the man kept begging for help through the door, he rose from his bed and found him a few loaves. Basically, the word there is he got up because he knew if he didn't, he would just keep banging on the door. He wasn't going to give up. So it wasn't a matter of, oh, you're my friend, I'm going to do this. 
oh, you're a pain, I just wish you'd stop. And that was the way that Jesus was saying, this is how you have to do it. Keep trying, don't give up. Jesus is saying we may need to ask God more than once. God might test our sincerity by waiting to see if we give up and go away too easily. Jesus himself prayed three times in the Garden of Gethsemane that God would release him from having to go through the agony of the cross. Eventually, he realised there was no alternative. And that is an important point that we need to understand. God will not always give us what we ask for. As a wise father, he knows what is best for us and for those who depend on us also. So, how does God answer prayer? So, sometimes the thing we think we need is not actually what is best for us and God gives us a different answer to the one we expected. Or he may fulfil our request but in a way we do not expect. For example, it was a time when Herod Agrippa had executed James, one of the 12 apostles. When he saw this delighted the Jewish leaders who hated the Christians, he proceeded to arrest his fellow apostle Peter as well. It was during Passover, a Jewish holiday, and Peter's friends knew he would be put on trial as soon as the holiday was over. So they all gathered together and spent the whole evening in prayer, praying to God to deliver Peter from death earnestly praying because they'd just seen what had happened and the next person so-called on the chopping block and so they were praying so hard. Now, what would they have been praying for? They were probably praying something like that the trial with the judge would have a, a different outcome, that there would be a little bit of mercy shown. Um, Maybe that he'd have a little sentence to be in jail for a while, maybe a couple of years, and then he would be released. But they were praying earnestly that something would happen. However, God answered them. God sent an angel who set Peter free from the jail. In the darkness, Peter made his way to the house where all the disciples were gathered and everybody was praying for him. He knocked on the door. A young girl came and answered the door and immediately recognised it was Peter. Slammed the door in his face, ran back inside, excitedly, Peter's at the door, come, Peter's at the door. They all refused to believe it. That can't be right, he's in jail. Um, they could not possibly believe that God would act that way to their prayers, that that's exactly what God did. God had already answered their prayers while they were halfway through saying them, but not in any way that they expected him to. So a couple of things. Can you imagine, just before we do a little summary, can you imagine if your only means of communication with somebody was possibly a book sitting in your lap, a little bit like, say, a phone. That's your only means of communication to somebody. So, as an example, send a message. Hi, Dad. I'm really struggling at the moment and could use some help. I don't know what to do. Son. Could you then imagine, phone off and leave it somewhere? What's the point? That is exactly the same as having one of those sitting like that. The only way God can truly communicate with us properly is with an open Bible that we can read readily and hear him talk to us through its pages. So it's one thing to pray, but it's another thing to wait 
and read and learn the answers for yourself through God's pages, the Bible. So as a summary, God loves us like a father because he is our father. We can share all our problems with him and ask him for his help at any time or any place. We could be in the worst possible predicament, in the worst place with the worst people. He's still waiting for us to call out to him. But we must always treat him with respect. We can pray to God anywhere. It doesn't matter where we are. We do not have to use special words or phrases or things that we've had to learn specifically that might help him hear us. We must have a humble attitude, accepting that we are sinners and that we need God's forgiveness. We must try hard to cleanse our lives from sin if we want God to hear us. God doesn't want us to do it by ourselves, but he wants us to start the effort and then he will do the heavy carrying. We may not receive an answer immediately and we may need to pray more than once about something, but don't give up. The answers may be unexpected. It might not be what we thought. We might have thought we were going that way and the answer says go that way. We make all our prayers through Jesus who understands our weaknesses. So together let's make prayer to God a daily habit. Thank God for the Bible which he has given us as our handbook for life. Thank him for Jesus, our saviour and guide. Thank him for food and clothes and shelter and ask him to continue to please provide them for us and our friends and those in need. Pray for the kingdom when the earth will be a better place, a place that we cannot even imagine right now what it will be like. Pray for each other, for families and friends and even for our enemies. And when things go wrong or big decisions have to be made, ask God to show you the way forward. Then, and only then, when you've put your life in his hands, you'll find true peace that is only available through powerful prayer. Thank you. Well, thanks, Steve. Lots of um, practical tips from uh, the Bible and from that talk tonight to help us make prayer a little more powerful in our own lives and to have an impact on those around us as well. As usual, after um, we've finished up tonight, there'll be supper. And next week, God willing, um, Peter Pullman and Brad Tregenza will be presenting a talk uh, to the title, Jesus, Healer, Teacher, Miracle Worker. So taking a look at those specific access, uh, aspects of Jesus in his life. So if you'd like to all stand, we'll finish as we started with a prayer. Father, we come before you once again, so thankful for the time that you've blessed us with. Father, we, we've considered tonight how great you are. You've created us and everything around us and we thank you so much for giving us life. We thank you for your son and for your word, which we've looked at tonight and for the examples contained in it, specifically tonight of prayer, the parables that Jesus told and the examples of people throughout time and how they prayed to you and how we might be able to pray a little more powerfully to you as well. 
We thank you as well for the food that you've blessed us with today and for the supper that we will be able to share uh, tonight. We thank you also for the forgiveness of sins that you've offered to us and we pray that you would help us to forgive those around us when they wrong us as well. We have considered tonight your awesome kingdom that will will one day be on this earth as well and we pray that you'd send your son back this earth very soon to set up that kingdom. And it's in his name we approach you now. Amen. Thank you. 